Tá mudo, Arlindo. I was already recording, <laughs> but my mic was closed. Sada Shiva Samarambam Shankara Sharya Madhyamam Asmada Sharya Paryantam Vande Guru Param Param Om Shanti 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 Om Namaste. We begin today from verse 34. It says that the behavior of the enlightened disciplined mind, which is a non-perceiver, should be known. The behavior in sleep, in deep sleep, is different. It's not similar to that. So now, uh, Gaudapada, following those same lines, yeah, is uh, is presenting the no mind of the yani, yeah, and the way by which we can resolve mitya without destroying mitya, because uh, we don't have the power to create mitya. Therefore, we don't have the power to destroy mitya. We can at most understand mitya, yeah. and then. Uh, here he puts in terms of behavior, the enlightened mind behaves or experiences the world as a non-perceiver, okay? This should be known by all seekers of moksha, of course, only by seekers of moksha. <laughs> uh, some scientists do not need to know this because they have no interest to understand the true nature of Nietzsche as such. Therefore, the fruits of self-knowledge is only available for the disciplined wise mind, which is a non-perceiver and these must be known, provided one wants self-knowledge and moksha. So the, the key here, that this mind is a non-perceiver. It behaves as a non-perceiver. Of course, it perceives the nama rupas, but it perceives in a different way. There is a passage somewhere here in the next verse in which Swami Paramartananda presents. You, if you perceive, if you perceive the the snake, and then uh, on a closer examination, you see that was a rope. So you no longer perceive the snake. Okay, so is the snake a snake? No. It's a non-snake, yeah? it's a rope. In the same way, so if the mind and the world is seen as Brahman or Atman or consciousness and consciousness alone, so you don't perceive the world, you don't perceive the mind. And that goes, goes to that talk of uh, no mind. So you perceive a no-snake once you know you perceive a no mind once you know that the mind is consciousness. It's that simple. No? The true nature of the world, the true nature of the mind as it was being put in the previous verse, the world and the mind, they appear simultaneously, they rise simultaneously, they are interdependent, but there is something which is free and independent, that is consciousness, that's satya, that's turiya. So if the mind discovers its true, essential, real nature, so the mind is said to be no mind. The mind is said to be a non-perceiver. The non-perceiver is an extreme uh, way to put it because uh, the Nama Rupas as to perceived is as if the rope in the same way, the, the, the snake is no longer perceived because you perceive the rope. 
you're going to perceive that all is Brahman in spite of the names, colors, and forms. So this kind of mind must be gained or, or developed or achieved, accomplished. You must know the behavior of such a mind if your goal is self-knowledge and moksha. And as we know, in deep sleep and in Nibhikalpa Samadhi, we don't perceive as well. But then Swami uh, <coughs> Gaudapada says, although both are no perceivers, there are no knowers. And in, all, in both conditions, in both behaviors, there is no mind, there is no world. You know, they are, at the same time, they are different. It's not similar to that state of deep sleep. That's the distinction, the important distinction that we were already work, working on that in our previous class. As we have seen, the yani tackles the mind and the world in a different way. It's going to destroy without destroying. It's going to destroy the attribution of reality to the mind and to the world by Yana. And then it says that, but by knowing that both of them are optima only, there is no such thing called the mind, there is no such thing called the world. They are only the optima, they are only consciousness, the mind is consciousness. So this is uh, interesting because it said here that uh, by knowing that the mind and the world are but atima and atima alone, huh? many times we look at reality in a negative way and sometimes in a positive way. This, this sentence uh, is an example of a positive way to say that everything is just Brahman. Huh? But it could be presented in a negative way, saying that uh, uh, the Yani destroys because he knows that there is no such a thing called the mind and the world because the mind and the world are only uh, anatima. Uh, instead of saying it's atima alone, it's anatima. Uh, so we go through the denial or the net net of this is not atima, it's anatima, 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 until we are left with atima. And positively speaking, you can say, you know, everything is only Brahman, everything is only the self, everything is only Atma. Uh, that is just a projection or superimposition. But all the projections and superimpositions, they borrow existence from consciousness, the Atma. They don't have self-contained existence. None of these Namarupas, such as our body-minds. So... Fundamentally, everything in Mitya, everything in Anatima is not real and it's not really there. It's just like a mirage, a projection, a reflection in the mirror of consciousness. Therefore, negatively speaking, we say everything is Anatima. And Anatima is only as good as non-existent, as we say. And how are we going to support such a, uh, a sentence, such a uh, statement is as good as non-existent? So we bring in the example of the mirage, of course. So the mirage of water in the sand, desert sand, you know, is there but it's an appearance that is as good as non-existent because it's not going to serve the purpose, you know, of drinking it. So this world does not really uh, contain intrinsic reality and value. Therefore, it's better we see everything as consciousness appearing as a mirage which does not really have intrinsical 
absolute reality and value, but it has utilitarian appearance, reality and value within Mitya. And since we live in Mitya, it's still. But fundamentally, this is the final resolution, the resolution that everything is Atma, instead of saying, this is an Atma, the mind is an Atma, because there are so many Anatomas. Every configuration is an Atma. Every nice mental state is an Atma. So there is only the light of consciousness in which everything is superimposed temporarily. So the sleep is different from Nivikalpa Samadhi. Yes, Nivikalpa Samadhi is self-induced kind of sleep with some subtle difference that requires my own personal effort, my punya. Yeah, my merits of discipline to to stop the mind, stop the thinking process, and so on. And uh, deep sleep is something that Ishwara gives us for free, yeah, to give us a a taste, yeah, a peace. We don't need any merit to sleep. At least, <laughs> at least at the beginning of our life for a long period of time, you get, oh, let's say. <clears throat> but the point here is that uh, this resolution is not the same as sleep, deep sleep. No? It's not similar to that because in deep sleep, the solution is only temporary and the solution is not really there because uh, the mind and the world are there as what? Yes. See it, potential. It's not everything that is waiting for a certain vibration to bring about the dream state and then the awake world. Huh? There is no such a thing as called the mind and the world. For such a yani who has this wisdom, his mind will not be with this mind his mind will not report duality this is beautiful he says because he was talking about the mind does not report duality and now he clarifies his language in a beautiful brilliant way he says because for the for the yani for the wise the mind will not report duality even though it experienced duality mm -hmm. So nice play of words, no? it does not report, although it experiences duality. No? In other words, it does not attribute reality to the experience of duality. It does not attribute the, the sky is really blue in spite of the experience of the blue sky and so on. No? His mind knows that the experience, the experience duality is nothing but atma, one atma of non-dual nature, the only reality. Such an enlightened mind has resolved duality by understanding that everything is consciousness, everything is the atma. Gaudapada gives that enlightened mind a title, Nik. Nigritam Manaha. It is a mind that knows that there is no mind in the world other than the self, consciousness, Atma. An enlightened mind is the mind that has dissolved the world and the mind by wisdom or knowledge. During the deep sleep state, also the mind and the world are dissolved. For both, for the deep sleeper and for the yoni, the mind is dissolved. There is no duality. Gaudapada asks, what is the difference between the, the dissolution or resolution of the mind in consciousness by from the yoni to the awakening, the, the, the deep sleeper? What is in common? 
is duality is being removed, negated. If both were the same, we all would say, Ma, what the fuss, what is the trouble about going into this self inquiry yeah, journey? I just take deep sleep because, you know, both are the same. So they are not the same because deep sleep, although uh, provides an experience of no mind and no world, it does not address the ignorance that attributes reality to the mind and the world. No? It's not going to address fundamental problem. The mind comes out of deep sleep and again continue to attribute reality to the experience of the mind, I, the mind, and there is the world. Gaudapada asks the difference. Both are the same. If we say, and then I say, okay, and then I'm good to go. I, I just want to sleep. The difference will have to be understood. For a sleeper, the problem is only temporarily solved. In fact, it is potentially all the time there during the deep sleep. For the mind of the yoni, the problem is solved in its basis, on its permanent base, because knowledge is that which is always good. You never, you are never doubtful in regards to the fact that you are a human being, not a cat, for example. So that knowledge is good and uh, does not require maintenance for that knowledge as the knowledge <clears throat> that I cannot fly, the knowledge of many other things such as two plus two is four. Those are good knowledge that do not require uh, maintenance or revision. Huh? For the yoni, the problem is resolved on a permanent base. The mind and the world are wonderful for in interaction, apparent interaction in the apparent universe. But the Yanni knows that the, the mind and the world cannot touch his fundamental true nature as consciousness, the screen or the mirror-like apparatus on which the mind and the world are reflected yeah, or projected. Therefore, I have no problem about whatsoever play. My Ishuna, Ishwara knows what they are doing. They will keep projecting this apparent order of reality in which I, the body, mind, sense complex in the world is going to be experienced, but I'm no longer obsessed and concerned about the condition of the mind and the world. I'm not obsessed with the condition of the body, mind, and the world, because I know that the world and the condition of the mind cannot touch that which I am, really. The screen of consciousness that somehow allies, allows this uh, superimposition with no resistance, because uh, consciousness is Kaka cannot even offer any resistance to anything. Maya, Maya can do anything. And our nature as consciousness allows in and everything. Allowing, allowance is a very beautiful word yeah, that points to one of uh, aspect of consciousness. Therefore, a yoni will allow the play to go on but will not be affected by the play and by the body-mind. That's called moksha, that's called freedom and independence from the mind and the world. Not that, you know, the mind and the world disappear, but you, you are no longer identified with the mind and the world, and then you enjoy a sense of freedom. 
and why it's important to to have this freedom due to detachment which depends on a lot of viveka and disciplines must be there desire for freedom must be there because we cannot rely on the world either on the mind <laughs> huh? the mind and the world is they are changing all the time the only stability security and freedom is in such a consciousness that which never changes never modifies Verse 34, Gaudapada Acharya pointed out that both the mind and the world are mutually dependent on each other. What is the verse? Ah, oh, no, he's, he's, he's doing some revision here, yeah. right? Gaudapada pointed out, as we have seen, that they, they are interdependent, the mind and the world. And then he brings some very simple examples. The ears are proved by the sound. So how are you going to know that you have ears unless there is sound? Huh? Very simple. The five senses are just developed like that. We don't know what comes first, which is the hearing, you know, organ or the sound, because they come together. They are interdependent, like the egg and the chicken, the seed and the tree. You cannot prove the existence of one without the support of the other. You cannot prove the, exist the existence of the mind without the support of the world. Why? The mind are impressions left behind. You know, through this, by this interaction between the Atma of the Jiva and the world. So if there is no interaction between this Jiva and the world, there is no mind. Right? The mind depends on the world, the world depends on the mind. You can never prove that there is sound if you cannot hear. You can never know that you have ear if there are no sounds. It's difficult to say what came first. They are interdependent, mutually dependent. All the thoughts put together is what we call the mind, and all the objects put together we call the world, the Jagata. The mind and the world are interdependent. And so both are mitya because satya is the only principle, totally self-contained, meaning to say, does not depend on any other factor. Is the causeless, apparent cause of the apparent universe. The mind and the world are interdependent, and so both are mutual. Our entire life is one of trying to adjust the world so that we experience peace. Peaceful yeah. mind can be experienced. Yeah. Isn't it? The life of samsara is just trying to, I try to adjust the world in the beginning, and then I see it does not work, you know. And then even Swami Paramartanada says, and then if you cannot control, manipulate and control the setup, you need to work on your mindset. Swamiji says on those ways. That's, this is the first step. You need to work on the mindset because unless you have a peaceful, contemplative mind, you are not going to be able to understand and claim your nature, which is totally free and independent from the mind and the world. We need a good mind to understand that I'm free even from the mind itself, isn't it? The case. Okay. 
So our entire life, we are trying to manipulate and adjust the world so that I can experience peace of mind. When the world cannot be adjusted anymore, one starts adjusting the mind. So now I understood the mind is my primary instrument of experience, so I need to adjust my mind. Yes, no matter how pure and refined and adjust the mind is, only self-knowledge will do the real job. You understand? So you can have a, as pure mind as possible, but the mind is still subject to change. No longer can you control the mind by the means of yoga and keep the mind on a certain state of peace because you would be attributing a state of mind for freedom, not a certain knowledge, which is always good. You want to be free of the world in spite of the world free of the mind in spite of the mind, but you need a good mind, uh, you know, a refined, subtle, sattvic, uh, contemplative mind. When the world cannot be adjusted or controlled, we try to control the mind. And then when I see that even the mind is impossible to control, and then I try to start, I go back to the world to try to manipulate and adjust the world again. Very nice, huh? How many times we go, many of us go through that. I say, now I'm out of this play. I want to control my mind. And then after years of effort, you say, it's impossible. Let me go back to the world. That, that was my, my movement as well. And then the world did not want me anymore as well. I did not want the world. The world did not want me anymore. Therefore, this situation goes on without any solution. Beyond all this, is this there is a third factor called karma as well. Ooh, on top of the problem of a mind that's always changing a lot of the time unexpectedly and violently with its motions and so on. And the world is also changing, throwing a lot of uh, adversities to us. And then uh, we try to fix the world, we try to fix the mind. And then when we somehow, we get some, some sort of success in doing so, we, we have to remember there is also karma operating. Therefore it's better I associate with Sishwara and I ask Shwara, Shanti, 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 help me out because there are so many factors beyond my control. Karma also influences both the mind and the world. And now he puts so karma also influences both the anatima. Now it's addressed in the mind and the world as anatima. Yeah? So what what are we gonna do first? We're gonna you know address or discriminate the world and the mind as anatima, or we're going to call them the atima, resolve them as the atima. Resolution is good as long as it sticks. If it does not stick, and then it's better we go back and. Say, oh Maya, you're still deceiving me. I have resolved all these objects of experience as an atima, but they are still appearing as atima because I'm still falling for your trick and attributing reality to it. And then I have to remember it's an atima, it's an atima, it's an atima. I am atima, the only reality, and I'm whole, full, and complete. I guess we have to do both, you know? Everything is the Atima and I am Atima. Like uh, my favorite statement or declaration, which was available in the New Advaita on those, my days when I was seeking. Yeah? Everything is consciousness and I am the consciousness. 
that's the same thing. Everything is only consciousness. Everything is only consciousness. Everything is the Atma, it's the self. The other way is everything that I experience objectively is an Atma, they're not self. So I need that reminder so that I, I connect the dots. I say, they are not Atma, they're not self. It's not a source of peace, security, and happiness. Therefore, once I know that they are, they're not self, they're not Atma. So I neutralize the deceiving power of Maya to deceive me so that I, due to a moment or two of ignorance, I project reality and value and I keep chasing those objects again. We do both. We call it anatima and we call it atima. We call it anatima until we don't need to call it anything at all. You know? Okay, Gaudapada says that this approach will not work. Therefore, one needs one needs to go to the root of the both, search for trace back the true nature of the mind and the world. It's easier for us to trace the mind into consciousness and not that so to trace the world in consciousness as consciousness because the mind you know is experienced as a human conscious mind you know so the mind is the cheat aspect of reality cheat, cheat aspect of brahman then I can more easily resolve in my own inquiry, in my own contemplation, the mind into consciousness. But the world, I need to understand that the world is the sat aspect of Brahman. And the existence of the world is just a superimposition, very tamasic, then superimposition in I Brahman as well. The same way the mind is a superimposition. I, Brahman, as consciousness. Tempering the mind, the Mitya mind and the Mitya world, now tracing it back to its real source. The solution is go to the source, and the source is such a... Once you do that, you have resolved the Mitya world meaning to say the mind and the world into such a, in such a way that Swamiji says that the Mitya mind and the Mitya world, they become kind of insignificant and will no longer trouble us. They will become non-significant, just a small little thing, easy, much easier to handle because you understood that the, the tiger is, is made out of cardboard, or the tiger is just a picture drawn on a paper, on a cotton box. Oh, you understood that the elephant is, is a wooden elephant. No need to run away in fear. Meteor will remain there, but its effect in the mind of the young is different. The young gain equanimity, uh, samatvam or emotional ba balance and resistance, strength, you know, derived from understanding the fundamental nature of the mind and the world as Brahman, Satchit, conscious existence of limitless nature. You can never direct temper with the rope snake. Oh, there is a rope snake, so we need to analyze it, investigate the rope snake. 
we can't really investigate the rope snake yeah? to see what kind of snake, how poisonous it is, you know. You can never do that. You're gonna handle the rope snake only by understanding that the, it is a rope and not a snake. And this is very nice. I like when he used these terms by putting the rope snake in its place. Yeah? I like to use it as well by putting the ego in its place. The ego does not need to be displaced, destroyed, but it needs to be put in its place. You know? Then the mind, the ego, and the world will become harmless. Or they will not create all the problems that they used to. They, they used to represent the source of problems. But with self-knowledge, those problems are handled, you know, in a way that they, they are not really a big threat, you know. But nothing can really threat our true fundamental free and independent nature as such it ananda. Only then the world and the mind will become harmless. And then Swami says that uh, the most important verse in the third chapter was the verse 32. in which it said that not to temper with the world and the mind directly. The anachima mind and the world are very fragile, depending on space, time, space, and Paravada Kama. Don't try to handle the world and the mind directly. Tempering with them will produce only temporary solutions at best. It's like water drop on a lotus leaf, I think. He refers to try to dry, huh? or what? What is that? Therefore, never temper with anatima, expecting uh, Permanent stable solution. You going to say something? I I think that on a lotus leaf, a water drop never penetrates the leaf. It has this lovely protective layer that keeps it intact. Yeah, I mean that is uh, a feature of the lotus leaf. But the analogy here, it says never temper with a drop on a lotus leaf. Never temper with an atima, expecting a permanent solution. The only permanent solution is when you temp when atima, the adhistana, is addressed and known. And claimed the mind is made no into a no mind, and the world is made into a known world. There is no world, there is no mind, there is only consciousness. And then it said that the Yani is has destroyed the mind, and now he has a no mind. But it's not a known mind in the sense that the Yani becomes dysfunctional. It's just uh, a mind who understood, yeah, that understood, that the mind is consciousness alone. It's very simple. There's nothing mystical about experiencing the void or experiencing no mind, no thoughts. Knowledge solves the problem in a very easy and simple way. When Atma, the Adhistana, is known, the mind is made into no mind, and the word is made into no word. If the snake is known snake, <clears throat> it is rope alone. When the mind is no mind, it's Atma alone. 
Atima with a superimposition of a name and a form, Namarupa. It's Atima superimposed. The word is Atima plus Namarupa. In dream, one and the same awaker divides itself into the experiencing individual and the experiencing experienced world. Similarly, the I, the Atima, with my Maya Shakti, bifurcate into the experiencer and the experienced. The experiencing mind and the experienced world. These dualities produce within myself by the power of Maya, as if consciousness will divide itself. When we say that uh, the true nature of reality is Advaita, not divided, yeah? and then it may appear to be a contradiction because Vedanta teaches a lot. A lot of Vedanta teachings is how to discriminate Mitya from Satya. So there is a fundamental duality, Satya and Mitya. So there is no fundamental duality because Mitya, as we know, is not real, but just a projection, superimposition, or an appearance. There is only Satya. And the problem is that uh, if we bring Mitya into the play, the superimposition is never only either the world or the mind. Understand? Both are there. And wherever there is in, uh, interconnection or interdependence or, or activity, there is change. And change is something very disturbing. In dream, the Atma appears to divide itself into the dreamer and dream world. Similarly, the Atma, the self, due to the Paya Maya Shakti, divides itself while, while it appears. What is the duality here? Experiencer and experience. Subject and object. The subject is seen to be the Jiva Atma, the body-mind sense complex. So when we talk in terms of subject and object, we always believe that the subject is I myself. Yeah? And this I myself is superimposed on what? I, consciousness. And then we have a, a duality, which is really serious, heavy duty duality. Because uh, in such a mutual duality, which is more fundamental, there is no problem because Satya is free and independent, not affected by media, but experiencer under the delusion that the body mind complex is the true experience and the experienced world is some a duality in which both change and then no chance for any sort of security or stability. Only after we understand this, I will allow the world to continue. I will not resist. I will not try to remove the world. And I'm not going to try to control my mind. I will stop trying to control the world. I will allow all Namarupa's plays to continue. Because I cannot stop the play. The play belongs to my Ishwara. But we can understand the fundamental true nature of the play. The play is what? The experiencer and the experienced world. The mind and the world. Yeah? The world occurs within the mind of the Jivatima. So... <clears throat> I have to understand the nature of the mind, the experience. So that's the easy way to go. Yeah? By investigating the nature of the mind. Once the nature of the mind and the world are known, 
we will respect the mind and the world to the extent that we will continue doing our duties, but we will now give it absolute reality and we are not going to take it uh, seriously. We'll give a little bit of respect that it deserves. To watch a movie, we make the required preparations, but we do not consider the move to be real. The world should not be un underestimated, but it should not be overestimated as well. So what it means, this, this, this thought of Swamiji, I mean, the world which is Mitya uh, should never be underestimated. Yes. Your, your sound, uh, sound, Ali. Oh, my audio, my audio now is bad. Está dando eco. Is it too bad? It may be on Philippe's end because I'm hearing everything very clearly. Not, not so bad. Uh, only speaker, speaker. Uh, are you are you are you hearing me, Mark? As if I'm talking on the mic or something like that. I'm hearing you, Arlindo. Hearing you clearly, but there's a slight echo effect. Okay. Because the only other option would be to restart the computer, but then we will lose uh, five minutes, and uh, it's better we carry on this way, right? Since we are already, it's already done to our time, official time. So what is this talk about not giving much reality or respect to the world beyond what it deserves? So this appearing reality serves a very important purpose. And we cannot just discard it as something completely useless because it is anachema. Say, oh, this is all Namarupa, therefore I don't care for it. No, no we have to care for it because uh, to live in this world, which is a mirage, like, you know, without knowing that it's just a mirage, it's a recipe for suffering, samsara, anxiety, desires, expectations, frustrations, anger, you know? So we need to attribute certain apparent reality and uh, respect this rather than just neglect it. I don't think anybody uh, got to self-knowledge and moksha totally neglecting uh, this apparent world uh, order, with rare exceptions, such as uh, in the case of Ramana. Uh, but most probably he, he took it so uh, seriously in the past, not in the, in the stupid, ignorant sense, but uh, one needs to understand Dharma and understand Ishwara and interact in this apparent reality, knowing that we need to refine and purify the mind because I want to understand the true nature of this mirage and get out of here. Therefore, watch the movie, but don't get too excited or identified. The world should never be neglected or totally underestimated, but never give overestimation to this world, neither to the mind. The world contains conditional apparent reality, 
should be treated as a conditional apparent reality. So it is an appearance and it's condition, conditional to a certain state. It's not really real. It does not, does not contains reality within itself, as we know. It enjoys a dependence and conditional reality. Depends on a certain state, mental state, and fundamentally depends on the self, Atman, Brahman consciousness, depends on myself. But in order to understand that I myself am the only reality, we need to give some uh, proper, sufficient respect and to this mind and the world so that we can complete our journey here. The conditional reality should be treated as a conditional reality, but it should not be given much greater status than what it deserves. It's just a always change Nama Rupa flow. This is called Jagata, the mind and the world affecting one and I another producing a flux of continuous change. Once we do that we have dissolved or resolved the mind and the world in consciousness as consciousness. Dissolving the mind into the Atyama is called Amani Bhava. Dissolving the world can be called Aprapanchibhava. Gaudapada did not give us these two technical terms, but Swamiji is helping us, presenting the subtle uh, technical expression for the dissolution of the mind in consciousness and the world into Sat, which is consciousness of Brahman as well. Two different uh, ways. And we can do this world by, by trying to uh, trace the true nature of uh, Saguna Brahman as well, Ishwara, God. And then we want to go to know God. We want to discover the true nature of God until we discover that it's identical to my true nature. Even after I solve or resolve the world of objects into the world, the objects, the world, the physical material, and the subtle objects continues, the mind continues, the world continues. The pot clay example can give to illustrate this. The truth of the pot is clay. The pot can be handled with the knowledge that it's only a name given to a particular form of clay. So, the part is not going to be destroyed by that knowledge. The part will remain. It's a Nama Rupa with great utilitarian value. This is what we call the solution or resolution through yana, through knowledge, through wisdom. The experience of duality is rejected. But the experience of duality continues. And the dissolution continues in spite of the appearance and the experience of duality. It's not that when the experience comes, the knowledge is appeared. That's what we mean by knowledge that we saw is good. If I take enlightenment or moksha to be uh, samadhi or maybe call samadhi, so when the word appears, what happens? I lose my freedom. Yeah. But the dissolution or resolution of the mind and the world continues even after or even in the presence of the mind and the world. 
Otherwise, I would be solving or resolving the mind and the world, but only temporarily. Physical dissolution through sleep and through mnivical samadhi of the mind are only temporary. Yana, the solution of the mind alone is the solution. Here is here lies the difference. That was said in this verse. For a wise person who has understood the mind as nothing but consciousness, the Atima or Brahman, his mindset is different. Let's see in which way his mental condition or his mindset was affected by this knowledge because this knowledge affects positively the mindset of the one knowing, yeah? the wise. For a wise person who understands that the mind is but consciousness, his very mindset is affected positively. The condition and the state of the enlightened mind is going to be different. So the behavior of that mind is different. His mind or her mind has the additional wisdom and his knowledge that the nature of reality of the world and the nature of reality of the mind is consciousness. It's like knowing that uh, the moonlight is only sunlight. I experience the moonlight knowing that that is sunlight. So I experience my mind and through my mind I experience the world, but fundamentally I know all apparent experiences, I consciousness experience myself. We experience the moonlight knowing exactly where that source of light is coming from. The difference in knowledge will not make a difference in experience very nice. Huh? It will not, but it will. Okay? It will not, but it will. So, why it will not? Because the Namarupas are going to continue to appear. So, the Vyavarharika aspect of the experience is going to be the same, but the pratibhasika aspect of the experience will be transformed. The Nama Rup is there, but you don't take it seriously anymore. You don't give more reality respect than it, it deserves. What is it? Every experience is moonlight. Only inform the person knows that the moonlight is really not moonlight. The difference in knowledge will not make a difference in the experience. Similarly, a yami will experience everything as before, but there is an internal transformation made by yama. It's not like the state of deep sleep in which the mind and the world are dissolved temporarily. It is different because in both these cases, the mind and the world uh, remain intact but unmanifest. Sleep and samadhi are not different conditions because the mind goes into potential state in both states. There are some passages that some of our Mahatmas try to present a very subtle distinction between deep sleep and Nivikalpa Samadhi. And Ramana Maharaj used to say, don't bother about that. It's more or less like deep sleep. Stay alert. So here, uh, it said that it's the same. Because in both of these cases, the mind remains unmanifest condition. Therefore, sleep and samadhi are not really different conditions. The difference between sleeping mind and the yanis mind is described in the next verse. Very nice. 
So how is my audio doing? Do you get better, Talib? O alto-falante ainda continua, Wally. Ok. The next verse should be, let's see, that is probably a very nice one. I have a bunch of people sending me so many messages. Uh, verse 35. Indeed, that mind becomes a dormant, dormant in sleep. The disciplined mind does not become dormant. That mind is Brahman itself, which is fearless and which consists of the light of consciousness all around. So there's the answer, he's presented answer of what is the difference of the mind of the young and the mind of the deep sleeper or the young in Samadhi. The disciplined mind does not fall for sleep, it remains awake and alert. That mind is the mind, or that mind is Brahman. Hmm? What talk is this that the mind is Brahman? That mind is Brahman itself. We have seen many of such statements. The mind is said to be Brahman because the mind knows that I am Brahman. Very simple. The mind in its fundamental, true, intrinsic nature is Brahman. So that knowledge there. And then it said that the mind is Brahman itself. The mind does not need to be destroyed, suppressed, or suspended, or become dormant in sleep or samadhi, the mind just needs to know that I am Brahman, I am consciousness. And once the mind knows that the mind is not really the mind, the mind is consciousness, and I don't change, nothing can affect me, I belong to, my, to Satya, everything that changes belongs to Mitya. So that mind holding this knowledge, Aham Brahmasmi, you know, becomes a strong, fearless mind. A mind that knows I am of the nature of Satchitananda. Therefore, it is free from desires and aversions, fears, because I'm the light of consciousness all around, self luminous in which the superimposition of Maya emerges and disappears, depending on my, on the state of my mind. Yeah. Okay, so let's stop here. We, we begin again this coming uh, day of tomorrow. I will be Back in Goiás, I believe, hopefully, Shwara really allowing. And then uh, we begin from there. 35. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purna Purnamada Chate Purna Sya Purnamalaya Purna Mabashishate Om Shanti 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 Om Namaste. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I made some posts on the Facebook and people are making a lot of, uh, give me a lot of feedbacks. Sometimes it distracts me. I don't know how to stop it popping on my screen here. So we meet this coming, not tomorrow, but Wednesday. Right? With the Mandukya, and then we do Gita on Fridays, right? Namaste. Thank you, Arlindo. Thank you. Thanks, Arlindo. Thank you.